On this episode of Lowbug Garage, I explore the interior of the bus. Stuff falls out. I work on the furniture a bit. Let's remove it this way. I give some advice on wiring. If you want to look at me, you can. And then this happens. I'm still smack dab in the middle of this bus project, but I did make a lot of progress on the interior. So in this video, I'm going to show you what happened up there. And I'm going to keep working down here. Now this water heater drain valve was leaking. I couldn't actually shut it off. So I couldn't pressurize the water system without some pouring out of it. Yeah, there's a little bit coming out. Okay. Now the easy solution is just replace the valve. Digging my stuff, I have a brand new boiler valve just sitting here ready to be installed. So I'm going to ignore this for now and see if I can figure out what's wrong with that. We're just going to pop this apart and take a look at what's inside. I'm going to pop the handle off here. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try a six point socket. There we go. See all the cracks in the rubber gasket? There's no chance that would ever seal. But, I don't have a new rubber gasket. But I do have a spare valve. Reattach the hose. Now another reason I kind of wanted to change that valve is the old one was at an angle. We can move this hose out quite a bit. This one's a 90 degree angle, so it goes much straighter to the hole in the floor, so it actually fits better. I'll pick up new packing when I get to the hardware store. I'll rebuild this one and put it back on the shelf. Now I'll turn the water pump on. Open the input valve here, and the valve is closed. We're under pressure, no water coming out. Still getting nothing, so we're going to check this one out. Yeah, a bunch of junk in that. Let's see how it works without this. Okay, now we got water, so we got to clean this thing next. Now that's what I want to see. We've got a working sink. I am kind of curious as to what these are. They look like a vent. Oh, stuff falls out. It appears to be they're just vents to the roof, so you can see it better from the inside. It's better than it was. This rust hole is directly below where the panel is peeling up on the top. Now I have that top sealed up. I'm going to go ahead and fill this up. I'm going to try out the low expanding foam body filler. So uh, I think that'll fill up that hole quite nicely. Now I'll just wait for the body filler to dry. Saw it smooth, we should be good. At least good enough. I let this body filler cure overnight and it looks like it expanded fully. So we just need to trim it off. I'm going to try that little vibratory knife thing. I'm going to finish off the white paint. Previously I had pulled off this bit of trim and found a lot of rust under it. Well, looks like it's still structural, but that is definitely rusty. And I just put it back on and tried to forget about it, but I couldn't. I had to see what was under there. So I pulled off more trim and it actually got better. This section here, that's not rusty really at all. It's, you know, a little discoloration, but uh, really the rest of it, it looks pretty good. So it appears that I picked the one worst section to look at. And I got everything out so I can finish painting all this stuff and put this panel back on and it should look like it's supposed to, I think. Or it will look like it's supposed to because that's the way it's going to look. And then get this section. Then I can pick up all this stuff and actually move this thing around again. This recliner looks presentable because of the cover, but I looked underneath the cover and uh, I think this needs to be replaced. And there's another cover under this cover. Looks like it needs to come out in two pieces. So we'll take this next cover off. All right. Another layer down. I don't think this is ever going to be used again, so let's remove it this way. There we are. Now that piece is off. The roof AC is working great for this area. 
I'm going to need to add more in that back room, but I'll get to that another day. But since this area is cool, it means I don't need this anymore. Now that air conditioner needs to get to outside air. That was accomplished in here, right there, through this trap door. So when you wanted to use the air conditioner, you had to open the door. You had to remember to close it before you drove because there's a little bit of a tire issue. I got one. It feels like the whole bolt's turning. I'm gonna have to get inside the unit and hold the other end. I don't see the tops of those bolts anywhere, so I'm thinking it's under these covers. So I'm just gonna start taking off screws until things start falling apart. There's one piece. Interesting, the instructions are inside of it. So if you ever forget how to use it, you just take it apart. More screws to take off. I think it's actually glued to the carpet. There we go. Starting to move. Ah, there we go. Here's a better view of that trap door. You see there's the front tire. And here's the little pull chain that closes that door. Those are the bolt heads that I need to get to. And there's a bunch of screens, so I won't be able to reach them from the bottom unless I remove the screen. So let's figure out how that works. Vice grips on one side, you joint and drill on the other. Some of these bolts are not as cooperative. This is not a light unit. It's out. Gravity helped. I'm very seriously considering covering that up with plexiglass, so it's sort of like a glass bottom boat, except a glass bottom bus. You watch the tire drive along. Taking the air conditioner out freed up a lot of space, and the view from the seat is way better. You can actually see out that windshield. I pulled the cover all the way off this couch. I think this one needs to go too. The couch is gone. But I found a lot more mouse evidence that I never knew was here. So the framework's going, I gotta clean all this up. I think even the fridge is going. We're just gonna clear out all the space and get it thoroughly clean. And this seat used to be over there, but I think it'll be better over here. Found some leftover house paint and we're gonna turn the shelves a new color. Now Nylite has provided me some LED lighting for a few other of my projects. Come to find out, they make RV lights too. And they even sent me some. Let's take a look at these. It's your basic standard RV stuff with a uh, on off in the center. And these should be uh, pretty low draw LEDs. So let's see how much power they actually take. I'm gonna fire them up here. And we have 0.5 amps, so half an amp. Now for comparison, I got an old incandescent style one. I'm getting 2.81 amps, so almost three amps on this one. A little over half an amp versus a little under three amps. There's about a five times difference. So these draw one fifth the amount of juice of these regular ones. Now two and a half amps doesn't seem like that much of a difference, but Keep in mind this RV isn't small. I got these lights in a five pack. And I got two five packs. So I'm gonna have 10 of these lights in there. So now we're going for with all 10 of them on from a little under 30 amps to a little over five amps. So uh, a 25 amp difference, that matters. So when you have the whole thing lit up at night, that house battery is gonna last a lot longer with these in there than the old style ones. I took out the shelf directly over the dinette because it felt a little claustrophobic while you sat there. But now we need a light overhead. I have this leftover wire from the ceiling vent. I'm gonna try to run that up and in in order to get our light here. Got this line for cleaning drains, but it fit fine right in here. A little spring on the end grabs the wire pretty good. They make tools like this for electrical wire. I don't have one, but I do have this one. So we'll make do with what we have. There we go. 
Found a little rubber grommet. There we go. I love self-drilling screws. They are the handiest thing. I always find out stuff is crooked after I attach it. Hopefully I can do this one better. Now previously, the lights were run on the bottom of these shelves with the wires running all the way through to the other side, then another wire run along the top of the shelf. But I'm noticing this is made out of tongue and groove material. Gotta fish a wire through one way. There. So what I'll do is I'll connect all these wires while the shelf is out, run them in this groove, then bolt the shelf on with one wire coming out the end. So it'll be like an electric shelf. This applied hardware works okay in wood. Got one of the shelves put together, wires in the groove, and I'll be able to connect it off the end. I want to try it out and make sure it works before I install it. Switch is turned on. Yep. That one's ready to go. I've got an interior panel pulled off, and you can see a lot of the framework is aluminum tubing welded together, and uh, I've got to run wires that way, but they ran the aluminum tubing all the way up to the ceiling. So the wires keep the panel from fitting properly. So I think I can just nip the corner off and be okay. I took off the top screw and then the next screw on this panel. I think I can flex it out of the way enough that I can get my sawzall in there and do this properly. Come to find out that framework was attached to the roof. That screw went in before this was all put together. It also appears the piece of metal that screw is in wasn't very sturdy. It just pulls right through. Looking even closer, it looks like there used to be another screw there that's completely snapped off. Before I go much further, I'm gonna file these edges smooth. A little tricky to get into, but we can do it. Got it all tucked in, now my panel will fit again. I lost my attachment point that wasn't attaching it very well. So I'm gonna repurpose one of the shelf brackets. Do something like that. I don't actually know where I want my holes, so I'm just gonna make a selection to choose from. Oh, we'll put one there, and one here, and another one, one more, and last one for good luck. There. I didn't actually measure where this is going. I just wanna be able to sort of put it in place and attach it. So I've got a few screw holes that go through a piece of the tubing. You don't want to go into a wall because that won't drill right, but you don't really want to go in the center because it's not as strong. It looks nice, but it's actually stronger near the edge where it meets the next wall on the tubing. So if you can go slightly off center, you're in better shape. There. Wall's nice and sturdy now. Better than it was before. And this bracket holds those wires in place so they can't fall out. Now, this panel can go back on. There we go. Found a couch on Amazon to help me fill up all this empty space. The first thing I liked about it, it was really cheap. Around 200 bucks shipped. The second thing I liked is it came with removable legs. And these are metal. I can attach them to the floor. So that seemed like a good option. And then I got it. Another feature became apparent. It shipped in two pieces. I don't have to turn this into a couch shape. I can mount either one of these individually. These come with this base piece, which is a piece of framework with uh, threaded holes in it to bolt legs onto. So I'm gonna make up some new legs to suit my purposes. Found some metal that wasn't too rusty in my pile. Made some legs out of it. I'm gonna make the seat brackets out of angle material and square tubing. Problem is, these don't fit nicely together. There's a radius in the corner of that angle. So you can clamp this square on one side, or you can clamp it flat on the other, but always leaves a gap on one leg. But there's an easy way around that, by taking off that corner. I don't bother measuring stuff like that. Perfect. Then it'll fit in nice and flush on both sides, and you can fill that up with weld if you want to later. Wasn't expecting that to happen. Paint dries real fast when it's still hot from welding. 
bubbles a little too. It's getting a little too windy. The spray's going that way. It's enough to paint downwind. There we go. Perfect. Now the back seat frame's in. On this one, I've got cross members going longitudinally and then more cross members going transversely. So the whole thing is boxed together. It's not going to sway this way. It's not going to sway that way. It's solid. Now on this front one, I went a little bit differently. If I ran a piece across like I did on this one, that'd be right here where your feet need to go if you're sitting in the seat. And that just didn't seem comfortable. I made two individual sides, so the seat will be solid from going this way. It's nothing really holding it side to side this way. But I ran this angle, so now I can get bolts in this way and that way, which will make that a pretty rigid mount. I just have to make sure I make this real solid. That way this will handle all the side to side motion with this one unit. Now I gotta give a lot of credit to my wife in this interior process, because she did things like paint those walls back there, and most importantly, handle a lot of mold. All these side panels look like this kind of stuff all over it. Now, they look like this. I just wanted to show that to you before I install the next seat and you can't see it anymore. Now in order to get that really solidly bolted to the floor, I need more than just a sheet metal there. Look, they have this gaping holes. What I'm gonna do is take another piece of angle, slide this piece in here, and use this piece to sandwich the floor in between. I'll have this angle, then sheet metal, and then the other piece of angle. So this is going to be spaced out a little bit, which is why I drilled these pilot holes near the edge. That way, depending on what thickness we have here, when the hole goes through here, it's still going to be somewhere more in the middle of the flange on this one. Now I've got a floor jack between the axle and that piece of angle, so when I drill through, that stays pushed up against the corner there. Ah, huh. carpet's only melty a little bit. Now this is really sturdy. And even though I'm offset right to the edge of this flange, you can see on the underside, it's right about in the center. So that's what I was looking for. Bolt it on the couch, and that got me the spacing for the other side, and I'll drill these to match. I'm going to use the same sandwiching technique to mount the side of the seat base on the corner of this wheel well area. Got the reinforcement angle and the jack used completely improperly. So this is perfect. Found a nice piece of plywood in my woodshed. Just the right size to cover up this gaping hole. I was thinking about going plexiglass for the glass bottom boat effect, but with the couch right here, people are going to be putting their feet there. You won't be able to see it anyway. We'll just cover it up with something solid. We're gonna bunch of screws around the edges into the wood. That thing's good. Obviously this bus needs to be recarpeted so I can cover up that whole spot with one clean sheet of carpet at the time. But that time is not now. Now is the time for throw rugs. There, it's totally fine now. So now there's a few different options for seating. You can have two rows of seats, a riding spot, where you pretty much are laying down with a seat belt or full-blown bed. And this also will go up partway so it could be sort of a recliner or up to riding position or back to extra people. I think that's going to work out okay. I've had this fridge in my shop for a few years. The main reason is things like freezing bearings to get them smaller and adhesives that if they warm up, they catch on fire. Yeah, I just keep that kind of stuff frozen. This is about the same size as the fridge that was in the bus. I think it'll be more useful because it has a separate freezer and refrigerator part. So I got the fridge in position. Now directly above it is an outlet. That's off the inverter. I don't want to run the inverter all the time. I want to be running on shore power sometimes. Right there, I have a shore power outlet that's left over from something I removed underneath that I'll show you in a future episode. But for now, we got a shore power outlet there. We're going to bring it up here. And now I can take the fridge plug and plug it into either shore power or inverter power, depending on which one I have available. That one for the road, that one when we're parked somewhere. The fridge is in place, but once the bus starts rolling, it could start rocking around. Now I'm noticing a couple screws behind the fridge. That looks like a sturdy place to mount a bracket.
I'm just going to use a silicone adhesive to hold these on because uh, that'll probably be fine. Key thing about using adhesive is you give it a lot of surface area to attach on. That's what gives you your strength. The adhesive itself isn't very strong. You multiply the not very strong by a lot, you get adequate. That's scientifically proven. I found this kind of neat looking retro microwave that sort of seemed like it fit the bus. It was only about 80 bucks too. Now I haven't actually plugged it in or ever tried it, but I was going to take that and glue it directly to the fridge with the same silicone. That way it's all locked together. Let's put a good glob on each foot. I don't have to worry about any mounting screws or anything like that. And if I ever need to take it apart, you can cut silicone with a knife. Just run a razor blade under it, it'll be fine. Probably. You probably got to get it in place right the first time. Yeah, it looks about right. I had to slide a little bit forward so the glue smeared a bit, but um, it's probably still fine. Just don't tell anyone about that. No one will ever notice. Oh hey, it works. Well, that's good. Now this bus already has this big inverter installed and a dedicated alternator running off the engine. I still got two of those lowrider batteries here. Now previously, the positive terminal was connected here, which went to there, and there, and then another jumper wire here, to there, and then a wire there, which went this way and this way. Then the ground was here, which went to the chassis. So ground is easy. But positive, I've got to figure out which ones need to be hooked up and where to put all the junctions, because there's a lot of them. I think what I can do is have one go to one terminal, get rid of this one, use this long one to go to this terminal, eliminate this one and have that one connect to there, which connects to that one, which connects to that one. And that just simplifies everything, doesn't it? I love this one. So we have one of these junctions with tons of things coming off it, going to two individual fuse holders, but then it goes into one wire. So this one wire is going through both these fuses simultaneously. I got it all wired up and working. It turns out I didn't need that wire and fuse holders at all. So it's simpler now. And there's room for one more battery when I get done with that other battery in the main lift. Now before I hook up too much to that inverter, I want to check and make sure it's working properly. If it's putting out too low voltage, it can make things like the compressor in that fridge run too slow, work too hard, overheat, I don't know, something bad could happen. So I just want to at least make sure it's putting out the right voltage. Now I know they sell plug-in voltmeters that would do this, but I already have a voltmeter. And a test cable. Sometimes I wonder if I should be doing those do not try this at home disclaimers. Because like when I plug this in and these wires are all bare and live lying around the counter, do I really need to tell people to not lick them? I don't know. I think you guys are smarter than that. If you want to lick it, you can. I'm not going to though. So we're going to plug this in, check the voltage we got. Okay, plugged into the inverter plug, hooked up to the meter. It's reading all over the place. I wonder if that automatically senses whether it has a load to it and the meter is sort of messing with it because it's such a little load, it doesn't know what to do with it. So let's try adding a little more. Now I've added a light. We definitely have some kind of power. And now we're getting a reading that looks more reasonable but also very low, 101 volts. Now this is also giving me right about 100 volts AC. It could be that's not a real sine wave and the meter's just reading low. So we're gonna experiment with that. Now I haven't had an excuse to pull this thing out in like a decade, so this'll be fun. Let's see if this thing even still turns on. Yep, got a power indicator. Here we go, it's starting to trace here. I always have issues with this camera and the frame rate on video screens and things. It looks like they're flickering when they're not. But hopefully you can see that is a very, very square wave shape. I'm going to move my test rate to the shore power because that should be 110. That one's reading right about 115, so we're good there. So that looks like what we're supposed to see out of an AC outlet. With the right voltage, the right shape, doing the right stuff. Now that I know that that's a square wave, not a sine wave, and that square wave could potentially have a lower peak but because it's longer and flatter, the overall voltage is okay. That brings me to the ultimate and scientific test. How bright is the light? Right now it's plugged into the inverter. I'm going to switch it to shore power and see if it gets brighter. If it stays the same brightness, that means our average power input is going to be the same. So it'll probably run the fridge. How 
I put those last two clips right back to back just so I could see if there's any noticeable difference at all. It didn't look like the brightness of the light changed at all between the two different power sources. Even though the voltages are different, the amount of power is about the same. I think I'll be okay with like the refrigerator that doesn't really have electronic controls, it's an on off on a motor, basic appliances, lights. This microwave could be a problem because it was cheap and I doubt the electronics are well built for different waveforms. So I won't plug that into the inverter, but that just means I can't cook while I drive and I wasn't really planning on that anyway. The fridge was the most critical thing. I think we'll be okay, so I'm going to plug it in and find out. I'm going to leave you guys in charge of watching the inverter controls when I plug in the fridge and uh, we'll see what happens here. The compressor sounded fine starting up and it looks like we're uh, drawing some juice here. So I think everything's normal. Starting off at 77 degrees or so. It's only been like 10 or 15 minutes and we're down in the 20s. About a half hour. That's the freezer temperature now. I'm gonna call this one a success. Let's turn on some lights. Now for comparison, this is a photo from before I started any changes. And this is what it looks like now. Well that's it for this video. I'm really happy with the improvements in the interior. When we first drove this bus, it was kind of like camping. Where before you sit down, you sort of check underneath to see if anything's living there. But now, it's more like a home on wheels. The layout's a lot more flexible. You can rotate that chair to face any way you want. This one can be flipped into different things. It all just seems to work. So I'm very happy with the results and I can't wait to try this out. But I do have a few more things underneath I gotta take care of before we take it for a drive. Hope you guys are having fun with your projects too, and we'll see you next time. This is a good spot to sneak a nap in too. Life needs more napping. Works better if I plug it in.